does the love of God abide in you? Okay, do you really have love? It was the summer of 2002 when 28-year-old Bible teacher John Stockton set out in his kayak, mapping a route for a future student outing up and around the northwest shore of the Big Island of Hawaii. His basic supplies for the leisurely journey included his cell phone, though its use at sea would be limited, snacks to sustain him, and a rain slicker. The first leg of the trip was blissfully trouble-free. But danger loomed in the form of a ferocious storm building on the horizon. I began to notice off my right a much larger buildup of a cloud a storm system. So I actually turned the boat around and started making it, you know, making for shore as quickly as possible. Torrential rains and powerful swells prevented John from reaching his cell phone. And that far out at that area of the island, uh, I wasn't going to try and chance losing the phone or getting it wet. I actually got overcome by the storm. Uh, the boat flipped over. As I began to right the boat, all I could do was hang on. It got to the point where hypothermia started to set in. And I started to think to myself, this is going to be the, the longest night of my life. And I just began to cry out, God, what am I going to do? At 4 a.m., 20-foot-high waves crashed over him and 60-mile-an-hour winds pushed his boat farther out to sea. In the middle of all this, John miraculously managed to upright his unwieldy craft and climb back in. Uh, I, I was dehydrated, I was starving, I was afraid, I was, I was completely exhausted. All my mind is, is bent on is getting back to shore, and the reality is crushing in that that is exactly what is not happening. You are getting taken further away from saying that, that was a paralyzing feeling. It felt like it was futile. I felt like no matter what I tried to do, I was, I was toast. John's food was drenched by seawater, and he was dangerously low on drinking water. As his prospects for survival diminished, an amazing glimmer of hope appeared. John spotted land. His spirit soared, and he spent the next 24 hours paddling desperately. I got to this point, probably one or two in the morning, where I just let out this sigh, I'm going to make it. And as I began to rest a little bit, I started to off. I paddled and I paddled and I wasn't taking breaks and my arms were just weary and they weren't really giving me much power. The next thing I remember is waking up about four hours later, I'd passed out in the boat. I look up and I'm 15 miles out to sea. When John Stockton got caught in a storm kayaking off Hawaii's northwestern shore, raging winds and massive swells pushed his boat out into the open ocean. Lost in the churning water, John later collapsed from exhaustion, waking up 15 miles from shore. I'm looking around for boats, I'm looking around for any possible sign of help, and there's just water everywhere. And the sun is caking down on me. I had ripped the skin and flesh off of my arms down to third degree burns. And they're just open sores. And every time I paddle, it's just this killer pain. I come to this place of desperation where, well, I guess I just try to sell them. And I'm 15 miles out to sea. And there's no way I'll get a, a, a reception. I opened up the dry bag and I turned this thing on. And uh, to my utter surprise, there's one little bar of signal strength going on and off. I've dialed 911. And I get this local lady, and she says, Sir, I can't hear you. And then I tried to, to call her back. She says, no service. Out of nowhere, I reach this pocket of clarity, and one bar up to two bar comes down. And I dial 911. And I get this lady who said, my name's John Stockton. I'm shipwrecked. I started yelling, Coast Guard, Coast Guard. Within seconds, he lost the connection. But miraculously, the words he had used to convey his plight to the operator would launch the massive search to find him. 
Minutes later, he received a voicemail on his phone from Coast Guard Petty Officer Justin Acosta. Starting around 5 o'clock for the next three hours, we started receiving phone calls from him every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, and they'd all last about from 5 seconds to 30 seconds. The last phone call, I told him, I'm going to hang up with you, call me back if you see our plane. I told him just to hang on, we're in the area, don't give up hope. John continued to drift into the open ocean. Navy and Coast Guard planes repeatedly flew overhead, but for rescuer Scott Gordon, it was nearly impossible to spot a vessel that small in the huge sea. When you search something in the ocean, it's not like we're searching anybody on land. It's a very wide area out there, especially out here in Hawaii. There's nothing really around except for water. Now John had a new worry. Drawn by the blood from his wounds, sharks began to circle his boat. And I know that I'm attracting sharks. And everything that I hear that sounds like a shark, I just put it out of my mind. If I make eye contact with a shark, I'm going to lose it. And when this shark hit me, you know, I came to this attention, I snapped to attention, and I took out the oar and I just started paddling away from it. John faced a third frightful night at sea, terrorized by the threat of sharks. John's hopes for a rescue that day faded with the setting sun. Day four, the sharks had eventually relented, but John spent an entire agonizing day searching the skies and praying for planes overhead to see him. John, after a while, was probably getting uh, worried if he was ever going to be found. Day five is really where I had an emotional reality check. I remember the sun coming up and I lost control of my emotions and I just wept. And I wept like I've never wept. And I took out this little Bible and I just started to read through the Psalms. Something in me just said, no, you can't give up. You better live and not die. And all I could do was believe. And I believe that that is the exact place that God wanted me to come to, to surrender. And if anything was going to happen, it was going to be uh, God doing a miracle to rescue me. And an hour goes by, and I see this little dot, you know, coming closer and closer, and it's this Navy plane. And the plane is coming directly for me, head on. When we got on scene, uh, we saw John in the kayak. He was waving at us. You know, he looked very uh, enthusiastic and happy. He was waiting for us to come pick him up. The Coast Guard surrounded John with flares and dropped a raft with water packets inside. I know that they they spotted me. Out in the middle of nowhere, they spotted me. But I'm just like, thank you, God. Thank you for letting him see me. Once we got on scene, the pilot went ahead and lowered me to the water. I swam over to the kayak where John was at. And, and he just starts laughing. He's like, man, you're really out here. You know, it's just so great to hear somebody's voice. And, and uh, he swims me out takes me up out of the sea. And this is the most surreal feeling. You're in this cage, and finally I get up to this helicopter. John was airlifted to the hospital and reunited with his family. To this day, he and his family look at his grueling ordeal and survival as miraculous. I certainly am very, very grateful uh, for, the, for the absolute miracle that God did for my family. I think that God was, he could have saved me the first day, could have saved me the second day, but I think it was literally, you know, he wanted me to see beyond a shadow of doubt that I was completely out of reach. This is what I had, have learned uh, as far as my faith has been validated in a big way. That when I was beyond all help, that God was still there. John Stockton's ordeal brought him closer to his faith, and from it comes many lessons. Perhaps most importantly, be careful whenever you venture into uncharted waters, whether they are natural or personal. We'll return with more of It's a Miracle in a moment. Next on It's a